Uh, well, good morning, everyone. This is the, uh, the money panel. Um, it, it may just be a banker's panel. We were hoping that um, someone from AVIC Leasing would join us as well to make it into a, a banking and leasing panel. We will see if he turns up, but we'll, we'll, we'll start anyway. Um, so if I can introduce the panellists that I do have at the moment. Um, first of all, Michael Parker from Citibank, Global Shipping and Logistics uh, Industry Head. Next to him, Kristin Holt from DNB, Head of Ocean Industries. Head of Ocean Industries. Um, I think that also includes Head of Shipping within that. And then at the end, uh, Franz van der Bosport, who's the Global Head of Shipping at DVB Bank. And I'm sure well, you've just seen him, and many of you will know him. He's based here in Singapore. Um, so if we can uh, crack on. Um, the, the, the subject for this panel is global shipping banks and the availability of finance for the shipping industry. So I said earlier, it's really meant to be focusing on the banking side. Um, and the first uh, topic is how do major shipping banks deal with the new regulatory and market challenges? So. Um, Michael, you're the only survivor from this time last year on this panel. How, how do you think things have changed during the last 12 months in terms of market conditions and, and regulatory regime for the shipping banks? Uh, not, not very much, I think, is the answer, um, which is probably a good thing. Um, we weren't, it was good that the last panel didn't blame the bankers or at least worry about the bankers. There's a lot of money out there, but it's... it's uh, fortunately not being thrown at the moment at the shipping industry. I think on the regulatory side, uh, and I'll hear what uh, people from Europe, as it were, want to say about that. I think the regulatory side is very much being driven by the whole IMO, the IMO grasping the difficult decision that the climate change conference in Paris had thrown at it, which was to come up with solutions for greenhouse gases. And it did that in April 18. All the discussion around, I mean, we didn't discuss ballast water treatment. That's, you know, it wasn't particularly well done, but it's there. Scrubbers um, and IMO 2020, that's there too. Um, but I think the pace of regulation for shipping is only going to increase the pace of financial regulation is probably, you know, as it is where it is. But even there, the, um, the unanimity amongst global financial regulators has sort of broken down a bit. And I don't think that's just to do with President Trump, but I think the way in which the ECB is looking to regulate European banks is, is maybe slightly more aggressive than the US regulators are on US banks. Um, the impact of that I don't think will be seen for a few years and that's really more to do with Baal IV. So the answer to your question is nothing really has changed in financial terms I think um, in the last 12 months but I think it, it will at some point in the future. Kristin, could you give us your, your views from Norway? Well, not just from Norway. Mm. I think we will say we are a global financial player so uh, and I will I will, I will give my impression just not from a banker side, but mm. from a capital side, because that's actually what we are doing. We, we do channel money more than just, just the lending. Uh, I, I would say, as, as Michael said, as to the financial regulation, we haven't seen much changes during the last years. That's just been, in a mm. way, softly increasing. The challenge, part of the challenge here is you don't have a playing. Uh, equal playing field with the with the various um, Scandinavian. You have the European, and then you have the Americans. So, uh, so that's that's a challenge. But that's what we have to deal with. I would say other issues that are coming on board, which we all need to take in, is obviously um, environmental issues, which. IMO take care of in, in one way for as a starting point for, for the shipping industry. But it's also how we as financial institution uh, or the, the expectation from our stakeholders as to how we handle this, how we handle scrapping of vessel, how we handle ECG or CSR issues for our clients, for the industry. What do we stand up to and, and where do we set our requirements, not just as a lender, but also from providing our capital in, in, in investment. I think that is maybe the biggest challenge, not challenge, the biggest new issue 
that's on our table big time from mm. uh, a year ago. And I think one example of that would be you signing up to the responsible ship recycling standards. I think as a, as a bank you've done that, along with several of the European banks. Would you like to comment on that? Yeah, I can do that. And that is one issue. Know, and we, we, have, is, but, uh, we have other yeah. issues. Mm. Or uh, RSRS, uh, mm. Responsible Recycling Group, is an initiative from... Uh, um, I started with some Dutch banks, mm. and some Scandinavian bank included, and, and involved, and, and, and other banks now coming in. And we have taken this uh, to the step where we now, in all our loan agreements, have a requirement as to the minimum standards for scrapping. And we take that very seriously because uh, today we the only commonality we have here is the Hong Kong Convention, although it's not approved or, or uh, about, um, uh, um, from enough countries. It's still what we have as the best measurement. Mm -hmm. And we have said uh, that's the minimum requirement. But as previous people on the panel also talked about, this is just, we have started. I think the industry has started late mm -hmm. to take seriously the environmental challenges uh, forcing or facing the industry. Yeah. Thank you. Um, first of all, uh, welcome to Wang Zhao. Uh, yeah, sorry um, being late. Sorry. No problem. Uh, I'll just finish off with Franz, if I may. I was just going down the panel on the bankers. Um, would you like to give us your view on, on the current market conditions, please, and, and how you see the regulatory side affecting you? Yeah, it would, of course, be uh, strange if my view was completely different. Um, I agree that not, nothing has changed so much. Uh, the worry for us, being a, a relative small bank compared to DMB and City, um, is that um, all these rules and regulations uh, takes enormous amount of uh, uh, manpower uh, out, of an, out of our organization, and the complexity uh, is becoming extremely, extremely high. Um, Gone are the days where we could approve uh, a, loan, a new loan application in, uh, in, in five days. Uh, this takes so much involvement of different uh, departments and, and functions in the bank, and, and, and that is not changing. That is there to stay. Um, we have compliance, CDD, FACTA, tax ruling, booking, uh, stage one, two, three uh, loan provisions. It is just so incredibly complex. Um, not necessarily that we get a better credit, um, but um, yeah, that, that is, I think, for especially a smaller organization like DVB with only 500 people, is, is our worry. Um, going to the market, yes, IMO 2020, uh, within our portfolio, we have analyzed all our, all our clients, where, where we see risk, where we see exposure, how much spot uh, they are trading. Um, we had to do that also to the regulator. Uh, sustainability, um, uh, what Christine mentioned about, uh, about scrapping, it's also in our, um, in our uh, term sheet and, and loan agreement. So, yes, um, the complexity is the issue for us. Um, Wang Xia, if I could ask you, coming from a leasing company, yeah. I, I take it you're not as highly regulated as, as the banks to your left. So, uh -huh. did you find the internal regulations a uh, a, a, a burden for you, or you, you have an easy time compared to these guys? Uh, uh, I'm not sure uh, you are talking about the regulation from the mm. inside of your banks or the market. Well, in, internal and external regulation uh. on, on, your, on how you process loans. Okay, and uh, for me, in fact, you know, everything you need to follow kind of regulation, right? And uh, the regulation, the purpose of set up a regulation is for to, you know, uh, regulate the market or your behavior and make the market better, maybe, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's not a bad thing. And uh, for you, all you need to do, um, in, my, in my opinion, is try to study hard in the regulation and uh, follow it and, uh, you know, to uh, make your service better and enter the regulation and to serve the market well. That's it. Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, I think if we move on now to um, the question of is the bank finance market shrinking or growing? Um, I think I have my own views on this, but um, you know, we've seen some new entrants like um, Maritime and Merchant Bank in, in Norway in the last few years. Um, but it, it seems to me that the, there seem to be fewer players now in, in the banking market. Um, let's start with Franz at the far end. How, how do you see the banking market um, playing out these days? Yeah, the banking market is a very wide, uh, wide concept. Uh, if, you, if you refer to, let's say, um, the traditional 
shipping banks, mm. uh, to which I think DVB at least uh, belongs. I think that market is definitely not, uh, uh, I would say, at the best stable, uh, if not uh, shrinking. Um, well, this is about I think um, capital for shipping, yes. Yeah, so I'm talking about this, this, what yeah. we call the shipping banks. Yeah. yeah. So uh, if you go back a bit, in 2012, uh, about 55% of, 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 of all the funding uh, was done by traditional bank debt, and that has gone down to less than 40% uh, in, uh, in 2018. Um, the share of the European banks have been declining uh, about 5% per year. Uh, whereby the Asian banks, including, including the leasing companies, have gone up uh, with more or less the same percentage. Um, but still, it's, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's a big pie. Uh, we're talking about, uh, about 250 to 300 billion uh, of, of, of loans outstanding uh, provided by traditional banks. And, and, and every year, every year um, there is a there is a, a new volume uh, required of, of of about 80 to 90 billion of which i would say about 60 billion is for refinancing of of of, of, of roll, rollovers of balloons and 25 billion for um, for for new building so it's it's still uh, it's still um, it's still a big pie but uh, yeah to answer your question is the market Growing or shrinking, I would say shrinking to mm. maybe stable at best. Mm. Uh, Christian? Well, I think it, that's uh, maybe just to talk about the lending side, I think mm. it's too simplified. And mm. we need to look at what are the capital going into shipping as such. And if you look at last year, I think leasing was 40 billion and bank debt was 40 billion. But then you need to also look at what's coming as bond debt and what, what, do you come, what does come in as direct lending. Uh, what is coming in as ECA, uh, mm -hmm. export credit. So it's a capital <coughs> towards the industry that's actually mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. And I think it, the industry has gone from being a, a less sophisticated to somewhat more sophisticated industry when it comes to use of the capital market. And, and, and uh, I think that's why we talk about how, how you diversify your funding source so you can use all these capital markets and not just the lending. So I would say from, from that perspective, there are fewer banks, fewer lower amounts from just the um, shipping banks, but there is as much capital as is needed, has been needed from the market as yeah. such. And, and the role for banks like you is to help put those packages together. So you're working with the ECAs, you're working with the the bank, companies in some cases. Yeah, they're different banking models and, and the way we have, and I think it, like, like Citibank has developed a, a model where we are advisor of capital, we channel money to the companies. Yeah. We don't just lend our own money, we, we use the whole breadth of the capital market towards the companies in order for them to, to, have, to use the windows of capital when they are open. And for us, that is the long-term model where we can make certain we have a business model that makes us predictable. Mm. Because for us, being uh, only providing lending is not a viable long-term business model. Um, mm. And that makes us less predictable mm. for, for our clients. Mm -hmm. I see Michael nodding. Would you like to comment? Yeah. <clears throat> yes, I agree with Christian. But I would, I would characterize, to answer your question, in limbo. And I think part of the issue is there is still a recycling going on. Uh, I noticed that NordLB, which unfortunately, Nicholas, is one of your global sponsors, have announced that they're finally getting out of shipping um, as a lender. And some of the portfolios, particularly amongst the German banks, need to sort of be recycled, and it's going through the hands of private equity or hedge funds. So there's, there's that element that the I don't want to call them zombie banks, but the problems of the last 10 years are still being resolved, whilst at the same time, as the earlier panel said, there are no, there's no significant new building orders going in, except in you know, one or two very specific fields, which is a good thing for the long-term health of the industry. But also, although maybe interest rates aren't, aren't going to go up as much as people expected uh, because of a potential recession ahead of us, um, the cost of capital for most shipping companies has gone up dramatically. So if you uh, are no longer being banked by one of the shipping banks and you're turning to the alternative lenders, then you're going to be pay paying a lot more. But equally, the alternative lenders 
are also trying to make sure that what they do is really focused around quality. They have other business um, opportunities they're also trying to seek. So the, the uptick or the uptake, uptake rather of alt for alternative lenders is really quite slow. So there is obviously a lot of refinancing going on where it needs to. And, but I think the, the thing that we're all waiting for, and it's been touched on by previous panels, is in some sectors, in most sectors, there is clearly more consolidation that's going to happen. That is a, what I think you know, will trigger a significant increase in public equity. So the Capital Link conference last week in New York, people, I wasn't there, but I read what people said and what they talked about clearly was a lack of uh, investor interest for lots of different reasons, but that will come when the consolidation that's necessary across the whole maritime uh, ecosystem starts to happen. And part of that, of course, is in container, it is changing business models where digitalization will fundamentally change costs. I think in the, in the commodity, in the bulk sector, what is underestimated is the pace of change which the whole ESG agenda is going to create. Kristin touched on this. We're only just beginning to start. The question that wasn't really answered by the two oil companies when talking about IMO 2020 is, for a policy that the IMO announced in 2016, why was there any doubt about whether there should be sufficient low sulfur fuel in 2020? And I think part of it was because no one really believed the IMO would enforce that regulation. And certainly, you know, even the Union of Greek Ship Owners was lobbying hard up until very recently. So I think what the industry has to get used to is that the IMO and others, and we're all under pressure on the ESG agenda, that pace of regulation will happen much faster than it's happened before. And that, I think, will trigger changes in business models. And ultimately, you know, Franz referred to just the cost of compliance, if you like, within a small but very focused bank. You know, the costs of all of this are just going to go up. And that's going to, I think, lead to, um, you know, more demands on capital for bigger companies. So I think we're in this pause where we see what direction things will go. I was, I know one shouldn't advertise other organizations, but I was very impressed at Marine Money in Shanghai recently um, to watch the Chinese lessors all together. And, you know, 50 billion and rising, they will continue to play a very large part, just as China through BRI or anything else is playing a larger and larger part in the global economy. And so I think the Chinese lessors, and not excluding other lessors, are really part of, you know, now the traditional banks, if you like, it's effectively the same type of capital. Um, and so, um, you know, there is the money there, there's plenty more money outside that would come into shipping if they thought they could get a return on the capital. Thank you. That, that brings us nicely on to Duang Zhao and, and um, in terms of the leasing side, I mean, I guess you see banks as a source of funds because you'll borrow from them to fund your purchase of ships as lessor, yeah. but also in the sense you're competing with them, with the customers to to raise finance. So, how, how I suppose, how do you see that relationship? And also, have you, have you seen more bank availability, less? Has it not changed in the last couple of years? Okay. Uh, first, I'd like to um, say something about the competition, yeah. like, like the competition you yeah. have, right? Yeah. Uh, for me, that the relationship with the leasing company and the bank, you know, there is some competition. But the competition is not to grab, you know, your clients, you know, to my size or, you know, uh, take one case from you or to my, case, to my pocket. No. I think competition comes from the um, service. You know, the competition is that we try to prove our service, you know, to service our clients, service the market as well. You know, like some, uh, I think, you know, Forrest uh, already mentioned that, you know, like a bank is a kind of a traditional source, you know, for the uh, shipping finance. And uh, maybe it's, uh, the common question is a new source like a uh, leasing company, you know, so some traditional and uh, some new, you know, it, we are nothing but just a kind of a financial service, you know, if all the clients who cooperated with us, you know, they can just get the, the money and the risk management advice from us. So the only thing we got to competition is not to um, maybe get a low margin a high leverage, but to service well, you know, to try our best to devote ourselves into the marketing of our clients. 
I think that's the part for me, the competition mm -hmm. with the uh, uh, bank or the bankers. And uh, that's it. And mm -hmm. uh, since you know, we get the principle that we, the, our job is to uh, supply the uh, financial service. So you know, if one side gets shrink, the other side grow. You know, I think the the target will will be you know, will be get you know, we'll get the targets. Will you know, fit the market. But you, you do you have banks bringing deals to you? Yeah. 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 So yeah. 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 Yeah, and like uh, sometimes it's a good resource, you know, for us, especially in some uh, new area, you know, a new country, you know, basically, you know, it's so hard for you to just to knock a client's door to, you know, get introduced from each other. But if you get introduced from the, the banks, you know, it's easier for you to get the chance to take the case and also get a chance to get the refinance from the banks. Yeah. Covered most of that. Um, Okay, um, I think if we, we move on now to just look at what each individual bank is um, looking at in terms of its own strategy and I suppose it's your sales pitch to the audience, you know, what, what's special about you, what are you, um, you know, what's your way of thinking in terms of putting new business together and, and servicing your customers, what, you know, what's your strategy for say 2019 and beyond, um, maybe I can start with Franz at the end. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, a bit same old, same old for like previous year. Um, um, I think what our ultimate goal is to I'll come back to this a bit later is to to keep a, a very well diversified, uh, very well diversified portfolio. Um, our portfolio at the moment consists of about 50% tankers uh, in the five different sub segments. Um, 25% bogus and 25% uh, um, uh, container, including container boxes. It has been very important for us, together with a uh, well diversified ge geographical spread as well. Um, as you know, um, because the whole audience is reading the trade winds, you know that DVB is for sale. Um, I think we, the shareholder, our shareholder, DZ Bank, is um, is, is weighing all strategic uh, options and alternatives. But so far, uh, it is for us business as usual. We have gotten a budget for 2019, uh, which is more or less the same level as, as we did last year. Yes, our portfolio is going down, uh, but it is almost impossible uh, with the portfolio for us at, at 10 billion with a uh, re and prepayment ratio of between 30 and 35 percent. So it's very hard to stand still to, to keep to, the portfolio. Yeah, so yeah. We, 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 we are going down in, yeah. in, in, in portfolio you wise. Not, no exposure to the offshore side. Yes. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's more or less our strategy. Okay. Because I mean, you are basically a shipping bank, aren't you? I mean, it's. Uh, um, I think it was a transportation uh, bank originally, so it's not. Yeah, yeah, you're not competing no, internally for other. After we sold land transport and aviation, the yeah, only yeah, shipping yeah. Uh, shipping left. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. Okay. Um, but I mean, I, I agree a little bit um, with my, with my colleague from from Avic. Um, we we are actually working a lot with um, with Chinese leasing companies. Actually, we are in the middle of closing a deal uh, mm. uh, as we speak. Um, as, as DVB, together with our aviation colleagues, we have done about one billion on uh, uh, funding Chinese leasing companies, and it remains a very uh, important part of our business. Together with uh, other leasing structures, such as Joko, which we try to arrange uh, with, 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 with our colleagues in Tokyo for our European and um, Asian and American clientele, um, and th those products also remain. Quite key well, for us. Can you talk about the attraction of that type of product, where you're you're lending to the lessor rather than to the, the lessee? Yeah, I mean, if you, if you talk about the, the Chinese leasing companies, it, it adds another layer of, uh, of, of of recourse to us. Mm. So you have the owner with the charter, and you have an, an additional layer of recourse. Mm. Of course, that comes with a price. You know, yeah. Chinese colleagues become extremely extremely competitive. Mm -hmm. We're talking uh, nowadays to the treasurer. So their alternative is, okay, go out to the bond market somewhere in the US uh, or, or Europe or, or squeeze our bank uh, mm. for uh, the, the last basis point. But okay, that's the market. Yeah. Okay, Kristin. Um, yes, I, I alluded to it uh, earlier in uh, responding to, to one of the questions. And for DNB, we are, uh, have been positioning ourselves over the years as an arranger of capital uh, across all the capital structures. 
for the maritime industries. Also not for ocean, but for this it's for the maritime industry. Um, and that means using our own capital, but also building up the capabilities to arrange for bonds in Norwegian, Norway or, or US for equity, for export credit, for um, leasing. We work with, with quite a few uh, Chinese leasing companies. So for us, it's really to be an advisor and to channel capital towards the companies, um, which has been our, um, it's our strategy and it's how we have invested in products and people over the years. So we have a rebalance the portfolio, but that's also to, in order to have a return on equity because what we need is to make certain we have a return on equity over time, which makes us uh, profitable mm -hmm. enough to be long term and yeah. that's extremely core in a business that is so cyclical that uh, the maritime mm -hmm. industry is you mentioned the bond markets could you tell us what's happening in the bond markets in norway and the us at the moment i cannot really? hear what you say sorry, sorry if you, um the you mentioned the bond markets what's the position with the norwegian bond market at the moment is that is there much activity there has been less activity so far this year than, uh, and that's also because of um, uh, investors uh, a bit has been a bit on the hold. Yeah. Um, but uh, what it will, what will come, they will come back, and it's uh, it's a good. Um, you know, even though when you issue bonds in Norway, most of the investor base is actually U.S. Yeah. So it's more that the investors, as such, has been sitting and waiting somewhat, both for the offshore and for the shipping market. Mm -hmm. um, so that's been a quiet first quarter from the capital market perspective. Yeah. But uh, there are more in the pipeline now, so we expect more activity definitely for the second quarter. Okay. And the Norwegian bond market has become an extremely important source of fund for the industry. Mm -hmm. And you have both the analytical cap capabilities, you have placement power for the industry, which you don't see in many other, um, um, basically it's, it's in New York and or in, in, yeah. in Oslo for the industry. So um, it's, that's also part of, you have to, as a company, reduce your financial risk by diversifying your source of funding. So banks are uh, changing their models, bond markets are in and out, equity is in and out. You, know, you have to make certain you tap the markets when you don't need the money mm. in order to <clears throat> reduce your financial risk. Thank you. Michael, would you like to talk about Citibank? Um, City has had a global franchise, this industry, for over 70 years, which has been focused around clients, and that is our core business is our relationships with the owners and companies in the shipping industry that you know we choose to, to do business with and choose to do business with us. But really from 1991, <clears throat> the time when uh, Prince Al Walid became an investor in City Core at the time, we realized that just using our balance sheet wasn't going to produce the right returns on capital. So we've been cross-selling uh, you know, for nearly 40 years, um, or sorry, 30 years. And so it's always been an important part of us, the return on capital. So size has not been important. It's, it's competing, if you like, for capital in a large global bank with, with other things that are going on. I think what... Um, so the answer to your simple answer to your question is we continue to do what we've been doing for the last few years but I think there is a very fundamental change taking place in the industry and as I said earlier I think it will happen faster than people think and that is the what is the industry um, and whether it is the pressure from what's going on in the environment or whether it is the pressure from capital allocation um, which I, I sort of mentioned about consolidation. What we do is deploy our capital to the industry. So we work, we're also helping with a number of the Chinese leasing companies. We're also helping many of our clients in the hedge fund business with their recycling of the capital that they have bought from banks that are no longer in shipping. But that is a transition phase, I think, to an industry that is going to be somewhat different. So this limbo state, I think, is ahead of the fundamental difference that digitalization will bring to the whole logistics sector. The whole strategy of AP Moller Maersk has changed 
uh, and the consequences of that and the relationships between them and their clients will be changed, they hope, by, by the better use of digitalization. So we, we don't know who will be controlling either the shipping or the cargoes in 20 years' time. So we have to be adaptable and make sure the capital is you know, deployed. So the ecosystem and the infrastructure of this industry, of course, is fundamentally very physical, and those things are very, very important. But actually, the value is in the supply chain. It's in what goes through the pipes, if you like, what goes on board the ships. And I think, as we've heard earlier, again, the, you know, with changes in accounting for leases, the incentive for oil companies and other commodity companies not to have ships on their balance sheet may have, may have disappeared. So I think changes in ownership, which will trigger changes in investment in the industry and investment in that infrastructure, they're beginning to happen and they're ahead of us. So the traditional model that we've all had as to who we deal with you know, is in the process of changing. And there are things, we, we call them internally digital disruptors, there are, th there are things going on in the way that happened in other industries, particularly with the use of technology, that could fundamentally change the processes that the shipping industry is engaged in. And when we look back to 2001 and the period of those early dot-coms, which never really happened, never really took over, I think we're looking now at a situation where so much in the way in which processes in business are changed through digitalization that that will trigger fundamental changes in the ownership. And those are the things that we as capital providers you know, have to be alert to. Thank you. Okay, Wang Zhao, could you um, tell us what you're thinking at Avic Leasing? Wow. What are you planning? In fact, the uh, strategy is a big word for me. In fact, you know, it's so hard to just uh, explain the strategy for the new year uh, 2019, you know, in just a few sentences. But I think, uh, to be simple, um, maybe it's the same like uh, Michael mentioned, continue, continue to do what we need to do and do some, a little bit of change to uh, face the markets, you know. Uh, to, to keep my chains up, you know, no matter uh, how harsh that, uh, this year's market will be, especially in some uh, certain section. Uh, but uh, we should also uh, stay on the ball to, you know, uh, keep doing what uh, we used to do. And uh, Michael um, also mentioned the change, you know, the change, you know, the change is always necessary, especially in uh, our shipping industry, because the industry always changes, you know. Uh, days by days, and uh, um, for the epic leasing, we'd like to maybe um, change a little bit of the structure of the leasing structure to um, take a better in, uh, service to the clients and to fit the changing of the uh, client's demand. And uh, we'd also like to um, step into some new area, uh, not only in the uh, type of the vessel, like the uh, LNG, like the uh, gas tankers, but also uh, in some new countries uh, like uh, Singapore so far, you know, uh, if leasing has only one Singapore client, uh, we'd like to get more uh, in this year. Mm -hmm. um, just a part of the strategy. Yeah, okay. That's it. Well, well, I mean, obviously, AVIC is, I think, better known for the aviation leasing side. So yeah. do you have a, is there a policy to say we must now have 30% of our book on shipping? Do you have a target to, to, to build up to? Yeah, uh, since you mentioned uh, aircraft, you know, if leasing's uh, priority job is to do the uh, aircraft leasing. Yeah. And uh, uh, that's the uh, fundamental of the company. And, uh, but we also uh, had uh, our kind of uh, ambition in the shipping industry. And we'd like to keep uh, the uh, ship portfolio in about 10% uh, to 15%, you know, in our total portfolio of the company. Okay. I see we have less than one minute left, so I'll just carry on talking to you, if I may. Do you um, work very closely with your team on the aviation side, or are you in a completely separate department? Uh, separate, separate. Separate. So I know nothing about the aircraft. Okay. Do you share experiences on the leasing side, or are you just entirely on your own? Oh, I mean, mean, in terms of leasing structures, you must have yeah, learned yeah, from your colleagues. Yeah, definitely, definitely. You yeah. know, uh, because, you know, sometimes the aircraft and the shipping, uh, maybe it's totally different, but sometimes share something common, you know. Yeah. So definitely you can learn something, uh, not only from the uh, customers and market, but also from your uh, co-workers, you know, the other teams. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. I think um, 
20 seconds left on the clock, so I think we'll wrap up there if we may. So um, thank you to the panelists. It's very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you.